Hi there, folks. This is Pat Battle with Living Web Farms. I'm here tonight to talk about a subject that is seasonally very appropriate, and that is solar resilience. The fact that as the days are coming to the end of their um, diminishing, the day length, and the days are going to begin lengthening again, cultures all over the world celebrate this time because it is a sign that that engine for abundance the sun is going to be returning for us and it's going to be driving the next year's growth of all of the things that sustain us it's plants are growing through the winter too some plants and there's food out there all the time as we'll see but there's more and more of it as the days get longer of course and lots of people and lots of life in all kinds of forms are going to stockpile um, during those longer days so yeah, we're gonna talk about solar resilience tonight. And that's the fact that there's one insurance, insurance policy we can all afford, but the only way we can pay with premiums is by developing a careful cultivation of one's connection. Um, to into tonight. And I want to do a caveat first off. This is not a field guide. Um, I might talk about an ident identifying feature here and there on something, but there are lots of field guides out there. Um, I have the caveat written here, but I'm not going to try and read the whole thing right now. But you, you do want to be certain of any plant that you're going to eat. You want to be absolutely certain. And there's loads of ways to do that. I think the very best way is to find a mentor, find somebody who has been doing this, who's eating these things regularly and knows what they are. If you can't find that mentor, maybe you'll become that mentor for the people in the future who want to do this. And then you're going to have to do a little bit of hard, harder work. There's a bunch of great books out there. A series of books by Thayer, Samuel Thayer are excellent. There's a famous from my era, Yul Gibbons, with books on wild food. Um, and there's loads of resources online. But of course, you always want to be careful online. Um, you want to vet that information. Don't just take it from one source. I'm going to give you a couple of um, links um, at, on our re when we get to the resources at the end. But you do want to be careful. And why you want to be careful is an, the examples right here. This is a plant that has just come to fascinate me. Um, it's called, the, it's a marigold, Tagades minuta. Line and buy it by the pound because people grow it for sprouts because of its fascinating flavor and it makes a great sprout. Um, and in the Andean mountains, this one fascinates me the most, and I've dabbled a little bit with it, but I haven't gotten there yet. They, there's a condiment known in English as black mint, which is made with this the leaves from this plant ground into a paste with chili peppers and other spices. And you can indeed go online and buy black mint. Now, why I say a caveat is because I have a friend who cooked with it and served it to some friends who were visiting, and one of them reported, lo and behold, that she got blisters in her mouth. And if you look at the literature, it can cause dermatitis if you brush against it. Like a lot of, like a lot of plants, the oils basically, I think the function usually is they, they kind of inhibit our ability to resist the sun. So you get it. Uh, dermatitis because you don't have your proper protection. Um, it doesn't seem like any of these effects are very long lasting. And I don't think it's particularly dangerous, but it means that you want to be careful with any plant that is no very novel to you. You want to, the first time you, you know, the first time I learned this when I belonged to a Stanford, a California East Bay, rather mushroom club. And one of the first things they taught us is even if the mushroom is edible, the first time you eat it, you eat a little, you know, you've thoroughly identified it with with those mentors, everybody guarantees you this is an edible mushroom. 
That doesn't mean you go ahead and eat a plateful. You eat a little bit because mushrooms are so novel to us that there could be individual severe reactions. So, you know, allergy type reactions. So you want to always try any new food first in a small amount. And indeed I saw online, I thought it was good advice with, the, with something like this and with plants, you might want to first rub it just a, in a little spot on your skin, just a little bit and wait, wait a day or something and make sure that you don't have a dermal reaction because that might indicate that this plant's not the best one for you. Um, we're all individual and the plants are really individual and they're complex, so we want to be careful of that. Example, weeds, woodland natives, um, all around us that are edible. So if we just look from um, clockwise here, one that I still haven't made a soup from, but there's a wonderful recipe in a cookbook by William Moyes Weaver that I want to check out. Creasy greens is what we call this in the mountain, the one on the, in the upper left corner, um, also known as upland cress. And this is quite abundant in our fields and pastures here in the mountains, and it, I, I think it's a lot of other places too. And what's interesting about this, well, there's a lot of things interesting about it. It's in the brassica family, by the way, but um, it has two forms. One is very dark green, and one is lighter green. The very dark green one can be quite bitter. Um, the, very, the lighter green one tends to not be nearly as bitter and more crest-like. I can tell you though that when Meredith Lee and I did a a cooking class on acid um, and the role of acid in cooking, I got a whole lot of the darker green one because it's one of the most bitter greens I could find. And we had people taste it with different acids and lemon, vinegar, just various, you know, culinary acids. Every acid made it that this green at its most bitter form was still totally palatable to a room full of Americans. And Americans do not have the greatest tolerance for, for bitter. A lot of other cultures are much more into bitter, but we're not very into bitter. So I think any form of this green would be edible, but you might want to eat the darker green one with acid. And then on the right, um, chickweed. I purposely did the chickweed in a bunch, um, just to give you the idea that this is one that's very stringy. And if you're gonna be cooking it, sometimes it's good to just take the tops and not try and take a whole bunch or chop it up a whole lot because it's got a, when I say stringy, it's got a lot of vine. But this is a, a very common um, cold weather green. It's, it's gonna, both of these are gonna be available in the winter. They're gonna take incredible cold and still be there for you to eat. Um, and something to remember, which I've talked about in other talks, and you don't, might not remember it, you might not know it yet, but in the winter time, the days are shorter, right? We just talked about that. The days get so short that especially on cloudy days, there are too many nitrates stored in these plants. They don't have enough sunlight to use up all the nitrogen that's stored. And so that can actually be toxic for us. And the best time to pick these is going to be at the end of a sunny day. That's true for any green that you're eating in the wintertime. That, I will confess right away that if I haven't remembered to get greens and it's a cloudy day, I'm still going to go out and get them and I eat them and I'm, I'm still here. And of course you can't tell it off. You go to a supermarket if they were picked on, in a, at, at the beginning of a day when there'd be not nearly enough light to have been exposed to them or at the end of a cloudy day or whatever, and you're, everybody's still doing okay, but it is a source of more nitrates than we want. So if you can choose when to harvest greens in the wintertime, choose to harvest them at the end of a sunny day and then there's no issue at all. And now we get to um, the next slide, the next picture down here is something called branch lettuce. Branch lettuce is a saxifrage. It's a very rare wild edible. I purposely put it in there because I want, to sh I want to make the point that you never know when you're going to stumble on something that's edible. And this is, you could be deep in the woods of the, of the mountains here in, in the Appalachians and come upon a, a, a babbling little branch, tiny, or just barely a seep actually, either one, that's got a lot of moss and stuff growing. And if you look close, you will probably see in the spring, branch lettuce. And it's famous for being kilt, as they say in the mountains. It gets smothered under 
classically in the mountains, it would be bear fat, but any fat, um, and you make kind of a hot salad with it. It's a really fascinating green and quite rare, but you may well stumble upon it and are a relative if it's another, in another country, but it's one to get to know. Um, Can you point to the branch lettuce? On the yeah, it's the, it's the middle one here. here like uh, yeah, right there. That's it. Yeah. The, okay. yeah. the okay. second one down, the top one's chickweed. Um, and then on the, but directly below that is sheep sorrel. Sheep sorrel is in the same family as is toothwort. Hold on, Pat. Can we start over? There was no audio on this slide when we were just switched a second ago. Oh, okay. So we're starting from scratch again? Not from scratch, just from about two minutes ago. Okay, so start again with branch lettuce. Yeah. All right. All right, so the next one is a pretty rare one. It's branch lettuce. It's the one there, right there in the middle of the three slides on the right. Branch lettuce is a saxifrage. Um, it is found in the mountains of North Carolina in the springtime at branches. Branch is another word for a small stream. And it's a stream that has a lot of growing area. It's, it's like rocky and stuff. So the branch lettuce is growing in the stream, but on places that are just above the water. Um, it's not growing in the water, but it's growing amongst the water and the, and the rocks and stuff and on the edges. And it famously is served as a hot salad. In the mountains, they say that it's a kilt salad, killed or kilt, um, or, and I would say smothered, smothered in a hot dressing. And obviously most people won't be using what's used in the mountain, which is mountains, which is bear fat, but it, it's, a, it's quite a culinary experience. And you, well, if you need to get food off the, gro off the uh, you know, on your own because you don't have access to the supermarkets and stuff. This is not going to be the first place you're going to go. Um, but if you're out in the woods foraging for mushrooms or other things, you'd be foraging for morels that time of year or something, and you came upon branch lettuce, you can sometimes harvest quite a bit of it. And nowadays I encourage people to go easy on it because there's too many of us and we're kind of extirpating all of the wild plants. But if if all bets were off and the grocery, st grocery stores were empty, then I would say that this would be another source of nutrition and people would be going for it. And then directly below that is sheep sorrel. Sheep sorrel is in the same family as um, dock or um, rhubarb. It's very high in oxalic acid. You don't want to eat a lot of it. If you do need to eat a lot of it, cook it in a lot of water and throw the water off. But basically what I love this for is to brighten up a salad. Pick a good handful of it and toss it into a, a mix of other greens. And by the way, a bunch of the greens I'm talking about here can go in salad. The young, youngest inner leaves of the um, curly cress, uh, uh, sorry, not the curly cress, the upland cress are creasy greens. The chickweed is fine, is fine in a salad. Um, you might decide to make a, a slightly hot salad if you had also the um, branch lettuce, but all of these could go in a salad. And then the next one, and this one, by the way, if you've got it in your garden, you don't want to necessarily encourage it because it can get pretty invasive. It runs, it's a, it, it propagates by making runners along with making seeds. So it's fine to have it in your garden, but keep it controlled. It's not, it's not like some weeds. It's not going to rampage and take over your garden if you don't kill every bit of it. But don't let it run free. You might be sorry. Just have a few patches that you know you can harvest from. And then the next one is toothwort over here on the can I get my hand to show you? No, I guess I can't point to it that easily. It's on the far left, um, on the lower left. Toothwort is a lovely spring wildflower, and the flowers and the leaves are edible. 
but what it's really known for is its root, which has got kind of a And then here um, is a mess of weeds. And I, I, this slide was inspired by the middle picture. The middle picture has so much food in it and it's amazing. Barely able to be seen, you can blow it up on your screen at home. On the right, kind of darker, is oxalis. Oxalis is another like, you know, um, kind of lemony flavored green that kids like to eat a lot. They call it sour grass, but it's actually looks more like a clover, but it's a, a not, not a clover and it's very high in oxalic acid. So you don't want to eat a lot. If you needed to eat a lot, then you would also want to cook it in a lot of water and throw the water off. But it's, you know, it's in there and it surprised me, surprised me that it was there. The main thing that's here is Two clumps of rock crests, they're, they're kind of in the middle there. They have little white flowers on them. And then um, sheep, no, it's not sheep's lettuce, um, sheep th sheep's th thistle. Um, it's not really a thistle, and it, but it is a good forage for sheep. And uh, our, not, not sheep, I'm sorry, sow's thistle, sow's thistle. And it's, important to know this and be able to recognize it at the same time that you may have wild lettuce which is on the left which i purposely put those guys next to each other because they can look very similar and they're both edible both of them by the way you want to eat young they're going to be quite bitter if you get them older um, but on the left the wild lettuce actually is medicinal too it's used for aiding in sleep and easing pain um, and it has a sap and you don't want to eat a lot of that when it's hot, when it's high in sap, that's you might get more of an impact than you want. So if you're going to eat a lot of it, you want to be sure to cook it in a lot of water once again and pour it off. Whereas the sow's thistle has no such problem. There's other ways to identify it. You can go online and look, um, but the the sap, the white sap in the wild lettuce, is going to be your major your major clue to it not being sow's thistle. And then on the right. There's actually two edibles in here in the grass. This is kind of like find, see if you can find Elmo. Down low in the lower left corner of the rightmost picture um, is a plant called grind, ground ivy. I'm gonna talk about that more later, but I just like to note that there's wild food everywhere. The main plant you're looking at here is so chan. This is a Cherokee green. It's also known as, it's also known as green um, coneflower. It makes lovely, um, sunflower type, small sunflower type flowers all summer long. But when you want to eat it is before it goes to seed in this early stage. And you can, you can keep cutting it back, it'll keep coming. You can actually cut from it for a long time. Uh, it's also one that's related to echinacea and has a fair amount of medicinal impact also. And one that it's probably recommended to cook in water, pour the water off and then cook it, you know, keep cooking it whether you steam it then or braise it, but you might want to pour off the first water. Um, you don't necessarily want that medicinal quality all the time. Okay. And the whole point of this is that the, there is food everywhere we never need to want, even if for some reason our supply chains are, are interrupted. And in the summertime, you know, mostly what we looked at on the last slide was plants that are going to be there for us in the wintertime or in the, in the, the ends of the years, either the fall, early, early winter or late winter or spring. And that was the last slide. This one is the stuff that's out all summer long. And we're gonna start at the top left with wood, wood nettle. There's two nettles and this is wood nettle. Um, you're not gonna see this growing out in the sun. It's gonna be in the woods. You might first discover it by being stung if you're walking in shorts. So if you do get stung, you can come back and identify it and collect some very good greens. They're high protein and and well worth eating. And then on the right, um, and then catty corner all the way to the left, kind of outside of the picture box, usually I wanted to squeeze it in there, is what's known as cat briar or smilax. This is a, 
a common woodland briar in the mountains. It'll really tear you up if you bump into it. But I love the tender shoots, which you see on a plate, they're all collected. And then I have one, a picture of it there in the upper right corner of what it looks like. They've got this resinous look and they have this complex flavor. And if you were trying to sustain yourself on this, this might be a great time to have kids and send the kids out to gather them because you don't get a lot of volume gathering them, but they are highly nutritious and quite a novel food, which is a good thing for us, I think. We, we reduce the variety of what we eat massively as we've become more civilized. And we used to have a much more varied diet and that varied diet, varied diet ensured that we were getting all the minerals and antioxidants that we needed, all the vitamins and everything else. And so it's kind of good to get out and get that. And for me, my favorite way to eat this now, since the supermarkets are open, is to graze on it as I walk through the woods in the springtime. And another thing to know about this is while this is really shooting and growing a lot, you tend to not have as much deer pressure because the deer are hitting this one really hard. And they're oftentimes like spending more time in the woods, chowing down on the, the tips of the smile ax or cat briar. And then the next one down is a favorite of mine. And I kind of left, I put the insect um, covered up one in there because I wanted to make a point that this is also an incredible plant to have around for all kinds of reasons. It's milkweed. Um, it's the one on the right corner, uh, lower right corner. And what, it, what is great about it is that it has two different infestations of pests, the milkweed seed bug and the milkweed aphid. Now, why would it be great that a, bug, a plant is infested with pests? Well, it's basically feeding all of your beneficial insects for your garden. They get, here, they get to come here and really chow down and get a lot of protein and then they propagate and are there for your garden. But what is, it's got several different ways it can be eaten. The one I really want to emphasize though is the buds, which I've known were edible for years and never have gotten around to eating them. And then I got served them this year by the same friend who served the Taganese Minuta to a friend and she, her friend got um, mouth blisters. There's no problem with mouth blisters from this. My only issue with this is the butterflies need the flowers of this so much that I feel guilty eating too many of the buds. But the buds cooked up are wonderfully reminiscent of broccoli. And I highly recommend experimenting with them. And this year I'm gonna do some experimenting. I'm betting now when I think about it, that if I pick the buds, they're just gonna grow more. And if I don't do that too hard, I won't hurt the plant and I can get a picking off of any batch of, of milkweed and still get them to come and flower, maybe a little later. And that might be a way to control when they flower, which is all the better for the insects. Um, because the uh, insects are gonna feed on, the, the predatory insects are gonna feed on the aphids and the milkweed seed bugs first instar, or second, first and second instar. But then the butterflies and the nectar and nectar feeders are going to be feeding on the flowers. So you want the flowers to be happening. And most famously, what feeds on this and is utterly dependent on it is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is laid on the leaves. Its eggs are laid on the leaves in the milkweed, and it won't make it if it doesn't have milkweed to feed on. And then the adult monarch butterfly will also feed on the flowers, as will all kinds of other butterflies. So it's a wonderful plant, and if you haven't had milkweed buds as a, as a vegetable yet, it's, it's revelatory. Um, I've been allowing a significant portion of my homestead to go to milkweed just because the butterflies are in so much trouble. And I know also that the infestations of aphid and milkweed seed bugs are gonna feed all those predatory insects and we have to take care of our insects, they're in trouble now. But I realize that now I get the reward of that because I'm gonna be able to pick a whole lot of milkweed buds. And I can't believe I've waited this long to try them even though I knew they were edible a long, long time now. All right, and then the final one is one that I talk about in all kinds of different talks. I've, I've been pushing this one for about 10 years and that's probably because I'm trying to make up for the fact that I didn't eat it for a good 20 years when I knew it was edible. This is really an abundant weed in a lot of gardens. It's Gallon Soga, also known as Quickweed, Whiteweed, Summer Devil. Um, my uh, mentor and friend when I worked at the Highland Lake Inn, Tresca Lindsay, who was from Belgium said, yes, in Europe, the French call this German weed and the Germans call it French weed. 
It's got all kinds of names. They're all derogatory because it is so massive in its, in its populations. But that's an advantage if you understand that it's edible because you have endless successions all summer long. It is not very interesting to eat if you let it go to seed. Right now at this stage, I purposely picked this picture of all the pictures I have because it's barely in seed. It's barely flowering and it's still fine to cut this. You won't notice the flowers. But you come back in about three days and there'll be so much stem between each one of those flowers and the leaves. And there's going to be less and less leaf, leaf and more, way too much stem. And at that point, you don't bother to eat it. But if you look just a little bit further down the row or something, you'll see another patch that's just in the perfect stage. And then several patches that are coming in successions afterwards. This is endless successions of succulent, wonderful greens that, by the way, are off the tri charts nutrition-wise. They're incredibly good for you. And they self-sow all summer long. And instead of being a weed that drives you nut nuts, just think of it as endless, wonderful greens. The same, my same friend who I referred to twice already, um, who this year turned me on to the um, milkweed buds, we were cooking together and in the same meal we decided to have greens with the, with the milkweed buds and I went out to gather them and I mostly gathered some other weeds which I'll show you in a little bit, but I included a bunch of this too and she said, oh yeah, that, I know it's edible, but she just seemed pretty dismissive of it. And then she bit into the food and said, what's that taste? I said, well, let's see, what haven't you had much of? And it's like, I think it's probably the gallon soga, right? And she said, oh, I have to go get some and try it and taste it on its own. And she's now utterly fascinated with the flavor. It's got its own distinctive flavor. And by the way, it was a major food in the Southern hemisphere of the new world prior to its being conquered by, by, the, by, by Europe. It was a major food for South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. So. Check it out. You're likely to have it. Um, I, I think if I had a garden and didn't have it, I would introduce it. And I know that would drive a bunch of people who have been fighting it as a weed nuts. But I eat more of that every summer now than almost any other green. Okay. Okay, so the garden can not only be um, lovely, but it can be luscious or at least nourishing. And my first example of this is oxeye daisy. I found them revelatory when I first... I first got introduced to this by Mark Williams when he was giving us a, a wild food. Mark Williams um, and a woman from, I forget, oh, Natalie Bogwalker, right? When they were doing a wild food talk here, I hadn't known it was edible or eaten it. And I was immediately enthralled with the flavor. It can be eaten raw. It's a fascinating flavor. It turns out that the, the daisies, if they're really daisies, are all edible. Now, you got to be sure that it's actually a daisy and not get confused. But the Shasta daisy, there's another one I forget the name of. And then this one, the Oxide daisy, Oxide daisy are all edible. I like this the most when it's in greens and not in flower, but you can eat it at any stage and the flowers are edible too. And, and I have a bunch of it in my backyard. So I can go out and harvest it whenever I want. It's in amongst the lawn. Fortunately, I don't treat my lawn with anything, so I can always harvest it back there. And another one that I put here, I have not tried this yet, but I had to put it here because I was really totally pleased that it's a it's also edible this is autumn joy um the autumn joy succulent and it turns out that most all of the succulents are edible you want to carefully identify each one because there's a couple that aren't you want to be sure of what you're eating but in general another one that that is edible is ice plant which i don't have a picture of or i'm not talking about here but i was quite surprised to realize that it's edible too um and so Turns out that you can make tea from the flowers. These flowers are past, so it wouldn't make a very good tea. But you can make tea from the flowers or even just make a soak them and have them as a cool drink. But the leaves also are quite a little tart and quite pleasant to eat too. Supposedly, I've yet to get to try these, but they're, they're edible and, and pretty much appreciated by a lot of people. And so just so you know, I'm gonna always be going clockwise with these pictures. Okay. And then and that's the way they should be listed in the, in the list, too. The next one is Dame's Rocket. I've got a really special relationship with this because, as it often does, it's quite the weed, considered invasive in a lot of places. It's in the Brassica family. Um, first time I saw it, it just showed up at the top of our garden at Highland Lake Inn when I worked there. And I was like, what's that flower? It's so lovely. A lot of times, by the way, it looks a lot like money plant, and people confuse it, confuse money plant for this, but no, I don't know about money plant being edible, but this is Dame's Rocket. Once again, you got to do thorough identification. 
Um, but once you identify it, these are very, the flowers and the leaves are very good eating, and I highly recommend them. And they can be very abundant. They're considered invasive, so you can go to town on them. Um, and then the next one is another one that totally fascinates me. It's got a name that <laughs> kind of calls up politics these days. It's Biden's Pelosa. Um, and it is also in the lettuce family or the Gamposa family, as you can see. And it looks a lot like a daisy, and it's also edible. It's, I first got to know it as a, a plant for a protocol. Stephen Harrod Booner um, was our main source for information on the herbs that we could use to deal with COVID. He wrote a, two, two separate protocols early on, a 40-page one and then a 90-page one. Um, and he said at the time, I swore I was never going to write another paper or anything about herbs because it takes so much work. I highly recommend his two books. I have them in the, in the res, on the resource page, Herbal Antivirals and Herbal Antibiotics. They're wildly comprehensive. Everything that Stephen Harrod Booner does is incredibly comprehensive, incredibly footnoted. Um, he, when he approaches herbs, he talks about how to use them in American traditional folk music, folk, folk uh, medicine, how to use them Ayurvedically and how to use them in Chinese medicine. He gives you all the science that he has on them. You can look at the papers and stuff. And he gave, came up with a whole protocol for how to deal with COVID. And I followed that. I've passed it on to other people. And we all have you know, had positive effects from that. I know the FDA will probably now contact me and say, I can't say that. But I can say from personal, personal experience that following the Booner protocol was very useful for me when I had COVID. And I've made a lot of the tinctures that he recommended, and I've shared them with a lot of friends. And nobody that I've shared them with has, ha has had any experience except for getting better. Some people were barely sick at, the, at, the, at first, and none of them reported that they had any severe symptoms at all. People with severe symptoms found that, felt that the tinctures and stuff helped them. I actually had to look up right before the, doing this presentation, because although I knew it was medicinal, and I knew it was used in Stephen Harrod Booner's COVID protocol. I hadn't looked at whereabouts. It turns out that probably why he recommended it is, is apparently good for arterial, arterial inflammation. And that, of course, is a major problem in COVID. Uh, it's, got, it's also very good for infection. It was an amazing insect plant. I mean, it was such an insect area. We grew a big patch of it in 2020. And the insects are all over it. And that is a joy for me at all times now because our insects populations are crashing. Anytime we can have a lot of flowers blooming that are attracting insects, it's wonderful. And this was really spe spectacular for that. It's quite ornamental um, in a wild kind of way. You wouldn't put it in a formal garden, but it'd be a wonderful item if you just had patches of wonderful flowers growing around your, your garden, your yard, even your front yard. Finally, and I can't remember which ethnic cooking I was looking at, but I was reading, I think actually it was Indian though. I'm pretty sure I'm going to say Indian. I was reading about Indian cooking and lo and behold, there they were talking about using the leaves and the flowers from Biden's Pelosa. So it's also an edible, which is the case so often the plants are not only food, but also medicine. But once again, a caveat in doing more research for this talk, I saw a paper, which I didn't go to because I really didn't have time to, though I wanted to, where somebody has done a study on its use in Africa and thinks that it may be um, one of the causes for esophageal cancer in Africa. And that might be for much more consumption than we're talking about. I suspect it is. There's a lot of plants that are food, but maybe not as much as you would eat your staples right now. But you could add them to your diet if you needed food or even add them to your diet if you didn't need food, but just for diversity and for different flavors and for adventure, not necessarily as a staple. So just to keep up with those caveats, do your research and check it out. And let me know if you have any strong opinions either way about how good they are to eat or whether or not they're really food at all. Just because they can be eaten doesn't mean that we necessarily want to eat them. Okay. So some more warm, se war warm season weeds. Um, purslane on the upper left. Purslane is just, if you haven't had purslane yet, you've got to go find yourself some purslane. Not now. It's, there's a, it's got a, a, a winter um, 
cousin that you can find right now, Miner's Lettuce, which has very similar properties, but it's more of a, it's not something that's in this talk because you've got to usually buy the seeds to grow it. Though I have ever walked on to old homesteads and seen a lot of it growing. If, it's, if it was there, it might still be there. Purslane is the second highest source of omega-3 fatty acids um, and therefore really good for us. It's actually, I think, probably superior because the first source is flax and you have to go ahead and get the seeds and then press them to get the oil out. And then the oil is going to be degrading immediately. You know, it's flax needs to be, flax oil needs to be kept refrigerated. It's very fragile. It's very, very good for us, but it's not the easiest thing to keep. Purslane, on the other hand, you don't have to do anything to it. You can eat it raw. In fact, that's one of the best ways to eat it. And indeed, if you want the omega-3 fatty acids to be perfect, that is the way to eat it. The stems are also good to eat. A friend of mine who was using our garden while we were away working at Highland Lake Inn cultivated or basically selected for a cultivar of purslane because she had looked up in Yule Gibbons, one of his books. Um, Yule Gibbons, by the way, in case you don't know, wrote Stalking the Wild Asparagus, which for my generation in the 70s introduced us to wild food. Uh, he was quite the character and he had several books, but the one I know is Stalking the Wild Asparagus. But in one of his books, he recommended that you use the stems for pickles. And my friend got into purposely selecting for bigger and bigger stems so she had really nice pickles. And so that is you know, what you can do with the two. I've never done that. And indeed, after she moved down, I didn't continue to select for big fat stems, but they can be used for pickles also. On your right, a little washed out picture, but it was the one that to me showed it in its, its strongest form is amaranth, also known as pigweed because it takes over. <laughs> now, and pigs probably love to eat it too, but I think it's probably because they think it takes over. And then red root, because if you pull it up, the lower part of the stem going down to the root is red. That's kind of a sure way to ID it. This is, was a major food for, for Amera Indians. Um, it's high in protein in the leaves. The seeds are also edible. They want to be sure to rinse them really well because of saponins. But it's very abundant and one of the greens I eat the very most of. The other name for it is Callaloo. And I had the, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Jamaica and do a little bit of consulting. And when I was there, I got to go to the market. And the farm that I was working with um, had brought Callaloo, that, but did not bring enough for the really strong demand for this green in Jamaica. And the uh, customers were pretty outraged that we were out of Callaloo. So it, they, there's a famous seafood um, stew or soup that's made using Callaloo, which I've never had, but someday I look forward to eating, eating it. And if anybody out there has got a great recipe, send it to me. Next time I get to the coast, I'll think about eating it or making it. Of course, I'll probably have to bring my amaranth with me because I don't think there's a lot of it growing on the coast. Well, there are some foods growing on the coast too, which I'm not gonna get to tonight, unfortunately. All right, and then in the next two slides on the bottom, we have the leaves and the stems and then the roots of burdock. This is a biennial plant. You want to let it grow the entire season. If it's a weed, you're going to harvest it. And then before it starts to go to seed the next spring, dig it. And you can see there's some pretty significant roots there. If you go to the store and buy this, the roots are all nice and straight. If you're, if you're um, foraging for the wild ones, they can often be very variable, but they're all very good to eat. And eat. It, they're incredibly good for you. They're really high in nutrients. Um, and they add a really earthy flavor to stews and soups and stuff like that. You can also grate them into stir fries, but they do need to be cooked enough. So I wouldn't necessarily do a quick stir fry with it. You might find that they're a little bit crunchier than you want. Now, actually the stems are also edible, but only the stems. And I have been served them by my friend, Doug Elliott. That took a lot of work because I've tried it. I mean, I would eat them if I was starving, but I would not. <laughs> Not necessarily eat them if I wasn't starving. Um, and I have also heard, though I haven't experienced um, myself, that the leaves are good when mashed up for bruises. And they may have other medicinal uses too. Um, also, once again, there down in the lower left corner of the leaf portion of the burdock is that a beak, you know, totally everywhere um, ground ivy, which we'll get a closer look at later and I will talk about more later. But it's there in this picture too. It shows up a lot. Okay, and then more summer 
summer plants both weeds or a weed and some ornamentals that were surprising to me to learn that they're edible. Okay, so the top left picture is cleavers, also known as bed straw. Um, it's got a bunch of um, names that kind of talk about its properties when it's in flower, particularly. It is known as cleavers because it's got almost Velcro-like hooks on its um, stems and on its flowers. And it, if you walk through when it's set its fruit, they're going to stick to you and then you're going to spread them. The part that's edible as a green is the young, kind of in the center picture there, you can see those young shoots and all that. They're, they're a really nice mild green and they can be very abundant. So they're very good for you. They're also medicinal. This is really good. Um, I know several um, herbalists who make a tincture of this and give it to people for getting the, the lymph to cleanse, to cleanse the lymph system. So it's a great tonic for the lymph system. And um, finally, it's related to coffee. And I haven't done this. I've actually several times tried to get myself to do it, harvest it loads and loads of the dried fruits, or the, the fruits when they're mature, and then dried them. But if you can see how small they are, it's going to take a whole lot of them to collect. But I, I can imagine that if, you know, all, everything ground to a halt and we could not get to the store and buy coffee, which I want every morning, <laughs> which I really relish. It makes me happy to have every morning. Um, I might actually, you know, put all the work it would take into collecting enough cleavers to have coffee once in a while, cleavers, fruits. I don't think I could collect enough to have coffee every morning, but it is related to coffee and people roast those seeds and, and grind them and make a coffee-like drink, which has less caffeine, but has caffeine. So that one, that was one of those amazing little facts that I really like. I don't know if I'm ever going to take advantage of it, but I like the idea of it anyways. And just to know that we've got a relative of coffee growing here in temperate North America, though only in the summer. I will grant that. And then another one that I've known I could eat forever and still haven't eaten. I'm really embarrassed to say this. I can't believe I let another season go by. I didn't get around to it, but hostas. Hostas are regularly eaten and prized in Japan. And at least one of my wife's friends has a yard full of them and has reported that she eats them regularly too. So I would joke lots of times if people would say, oh, I don't have any sun. I'd say, well, you can grow hostas and eat those because they don't need very much sun. But it's one that you might not think. And if, if we suddenly couldn't get food, lots of people have loads of hostas growing and they could be food too. And then this picture I took right from Baker's Creek and they hopefully, Baker's Creek Seed Company, I'm going to give them a plug and hopefully they won't mind that I took their picture. I couldn't find a good picture otherwise. Um, and I haven't grown it recently, but I plan on buying their seed and growing it. This is a particular variety of Celosia that is excellent. And I have to go back and look it up. I'm sorry, I meant to put the name of it down there. I forgot, but I will look it up and add it to the resource page that is meant as an ornamental and a great dried flower. I did jump for the first time. Pardon me. I jumped to the lower left rather than the, the next one there. I meant to go clockwise. So I'm going to get back to daylilies and pina. Peonies. And I see why now I have the Celosia out of order in my listing. It should be at the bottom of that list. It's going clockwise. But Celosia, you can make a, a drink, a tea from the flowers. I don't know what it tastes like. I haven't done it yet. But the greens are edible. And so you could grow a lot of Celosia. And then when you need to thin it, you could be eating it. Or if we suddenly didn't have food, you could just go out and harvest your Celosia for food. So that's quite a surprise to me, but not, not, all, not as surprising as, as I might think when I think about the family. And then in the lower right corner, you have both peonies and daylilies growing. And daylilies might be one of the better known edible flowers. They're in the onion family. I get a bit of an onion flavor from them and you can eat the buds or the flowers. They're quite edible and quite tasty and abundant as can be. You have no, there's no shortage of daylilies, that's for sure. And then I believe actually the roots might be edible too, but you'd have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure they are. And then finally, peonies. Peonies are edible, both the flowers and the leaves. And the flowers were used a lot in medieval times. So pretty fun that a lot of your yard is edible. One that I don't have on here that I really want to taste before I go further. I didn't get around to tasting 
the berries of it until they were quite old and dried and they were not exciting at all, but they might be quite exciting when they're young. And that's crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle is a lovely plant. It's all over the southeast and the berries are edible and the leaves can be used like bay leaves. So I'll let you know next year. A lot of these things, researching for this, I realized I haven't eaten this yet and I'm not going to claim I know how something tastes if I haven't had it. But I plan on eating it next year and I encourage you to experiment once you've thoroughly identified and let me know if you've got any favorites or if it's in the category of famine food. We're going to get to that. Some things are edible, but that doesn't mean we want to eat them unless we have to. All right. And another one that really surprised me on the left, goldenrod. Goldenrod, it's all over the place. It gets a bum rap as being the source of hay fever. Its pollen is very heavy and is not, it's, it's moved around by insects. You are not going to experience um, goldenrod as a, as, as a source of, of allergies, even though people think it is. It's, it is the ragweed that's the causing the allergies. It's not the goldenrod. So don't go wiping out the goldenrod because on the left, you can see it's an incredible insectiary. Once again, aphids have taken over this plant. And if you look really carefully, right above the ladybug, which everybody knows probably, on the right, there is a lacewing larva, which is, has an aphid in its jaws. So it's quite a, quite a, these, these particular aphids are the, are the goldenrod aphid and they show up in late spring around here, or very early summer, and they cover every, every goldenrod most years. Some years there aren't any, you can't tell with insects, but most years they're on almost every goldenrod. The goldenrods do fine, and meanwhile, all the beneficial insects have an incredible protein buffet for several weeks in the spring. But on the left is the, the plant and flower. People make tea from the flowers. And then the greens, probably before they go to flower, are reportedly edible and I've yet to cook them. But it's amazing to think about it because there's a lot of goldenrod everywhere. It's, there's many different um, varieties of it, but there's a lot of goldenrod out there. And then one that at least in my lawn and all over here in Western North Carolina is abundant, is violets. And most of these are edible. You wanna make sure and identify it and look up the specific one, make sure that it's edible. I think there's one that might not be edible, but mostly they're great eating. And years ago, I read Susan Weed's description of all the medicinal qualities of violets, and it is an incredibly medicinal plant. I don't remember those right now, unfortunately, but it's, it's got a lot of medicinal qualities, but it's kind of the idea of Food is medicine. It's not so much I think that people make medicine from it, it's that they eat it because it's good for them and it's good for some specific maladies too. So that's another one. Of course, lovely, you can definitely decorate your salads with, with the flowers, but the leaves are also edible and it's very abundant. Okay, and then you can actually landscape with edible and medicinal roots. And this one here is another one that is pretty astounding to me anyway. There's, you can eat any canna lily. It would be that not the leaves, it'd be the roots, but there's a particular one that's got better quality and that's canna edulis. It's very, very productive, but it looks like a canna lily. It's, you know, it's, it's as ornamental as a canna lily. Interestingly, as far as talking about medicinals in the same picture, there's one we're gonna visit again and that's echinacea and that's a wonderful medicinal. You can't get to a pharmacy and you've got, or the pharmacies don't have anything on their shelves and you have to deal with viruses, then the echinaceas are really good. They're, they're very effective. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then to the right of that is what grows in lots of yards and it's known as, known as elephant ears. Turns out that is taro. Now here in the United States, we don't grow taro as the staple that it has grown, grown for throughout much of the world, but we could actually eat the taro we're growing if we needed to. It may not be very good because it wasn't developed for food. It was developed to be an ornamental. It's got one use advantage. The deer are not going to touch this and you never want to eat this, any, any part of this plant. The leaves are edible also, by the way, but you don't want to eat any of this without cooking it and cooking it and cooking it. You have to cook it long enough to denature the calcium silica that's in there or silicate. I forget which it is, but I know from experience that you do not want to experience that. I was cooking with my same adventurous friend as far as wild foods go. And 
she had me in charge of it because I made my living as a cook. But as a cook, I always taste as I go. So I thought it was cooked enough and I figured I'd taste it. Immediate experiences like eating glass, calcium silica. What do you make glass out of? I didn't swallow it, but both my, my friends who I was cooking with were really worried because they know how poisonous it is to ingest this. You don't ingest it until you really, 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 really thorough, thoroughly cook it. And indeed, we cooked it a bunch more and then we all ate some and decided it still wasn't cooked enough. I did, we didn't have the experience that I had of eating glass, but it still wasn't right. So it'd be something to put in a long cooking stew or in a crock pot or something like that, or a soup that gets lots of cooking. Or if you're gonna cook it for greens, just put it on the pot and cook up the old time mountain way of making collards, which is half the day, you know, maybe with a ham hock. I haven't tried it with a ham hock yet, but it is an edible green and the root could be edible too. And really what I'd say is, now that we know that there's edible cultivars, if you want to have your yard decorated with elephant ears, find the edible cultivar and replace that ornamental that you bought with the edible cultivar. It'll have the same leaf presentation, but it'll be edible. And it is reasonably hardy, but you do want to mulch it well. Okay, and then as we continue to go counterclockwise, I've long known that dahlias were edible. By the way, so are tulips. And indeed, during World War II, when the Nazis were basically starving Holland um, towards the end of the war, war, because they wanted all the food for Germany as Germany was losing the war, and they just took everything that Holland had to eat, people ate a lot of tulip bulbs, okay? Not daffodils, by the way, tulips. Daffodils are poisonous, remember that. And indeed, people plant daffodils around trees because the poisonous quality might repel voles and stuff. I'm not sure that works, but they're that poisonous. So you don't want to eat these. But this is a special cultivar. This is a cultivar developed by a great company called Cultivariable. Got to get them in the re resource list too. Um, and they've been, they've been selecting for culinary quality of dahlias. And they, this picture here comes from Chris Smith. Thank you, Chris Smith. Chris Smith is the head of the Utopian Seed Foundation. And they're trying to help us to develop crops that will help us to adapt to the fact that we are changing the climate and that there is definitely going to be more extreme weather, possibly more droughts, and we just need to have a wider um, toolbox as far as plants goes if we're going to actually thrive during this time of basically severe weather disruption. And they, he's also working with both the Canna agilis and the um, elephant ears are taro. By the way, I didn't really talk about it, but the main reason people grow taro is for its starchy root, which you also have to cook a lot. Anyway, you could also grow dahlias and the flowers are quite nice. They're, they're not the big, huge dinner plate type, but they're re really nice flowers. I put an example in this picture and they, get, they produce abundant tubers. So you could easily eat a bunch of those tubers and then plant some and have just as many next year. So you could be eating these all the time or if suddenly we needed to access food, you could be accessing the dahlias that are in your yard. They might not taste very good, but they're perfectly edible. You could also eat the flowers. Um, but if you bother to seek out and grow the cultivariably variable um, selections, then you would have access to something that was actually pretty tasty. And then finally is turmeric, which is not really widely grown as an, or, as an ornamental, but there's no reason why it couldn't be. It's actually part, partly hardy. If you mulch it really well, it'll probably make it, at least here where we are, which is zone six or seven. Um, though sometimes it feels like it's five and a half, like this weekend's coming up, deep cold. Uh, but it's a very, Lovely plant. This is in flower. I picked it purposely when it was in flower. And turmeric, of course, is amazing medicine. Just incredible for, for um, inflammation. I, I get from my friend Greta Dietrich, I get her turmeric, um, black pepper tincture, and it just takes any of my aches and pains away. And I've given it to other people and they're just like, that was revelatory. I send it to my brother regularly. Um, as we get older, we get those aches and pains and turmeric is a wonderful solution to that. Know that if you're using it for yourself, you don't need to get somebody else's tincture. You can just eat it and get a similar thing, but you want to eat it with fat. 
It needs to be eaten with fat. Um, and then interestingly below that is sweet potatoes. There's two different kinds of sweet potatoes there. There's the cut leaf and the morning glory leaf. And we all know how nutritious sweet potatoes are, right? They're a nutrition powerhouse. What they lack is protein. But if you're eating the leaves, you get the protein. And another one, you know, that you should know that's in your garden that you don't think of as food, but if suddenly we need to think of everything as food, you can eat the young tips and leaves of squash. They've got to be cooked a little longer because they're kind of hairy, but they're also very delicious and pretty nutritious. And interestingly, this um, summer, I had some folks from Southeast Asia come and tour, and this one Laotian ag professor um, walked by looking at our, our Thai squashes and said, oh yeah, we grow those too, but we mostly grow them for the greens. So uh, this wonderful green, I mean squash that we all love to grow, Thai king cob, I think it's called. Um, it's also available from Baker's Creek, by the way. Uh, it's a really great, they have a bunch of really great Asian squashes. It's just a great squash. We grow it. It's a dry, flaky, really interesting squash. But in Laos, they don't grow it for the squash. They grow it for the greens, you know. So just know that if suddenly you need to find food, you could also be accessing your sweet potatoes and your squash earlier and eat some of the greens. You would do it carefully, of course, because you still want to get the, the winter crop out of it, but you could be eating those too. Okay. All right, and then one that I have eaten as a flower and don't like at all. <laughs> it's got, I get a, a, a catch in the back of my throat if I eat evening primrose flowers. Um, there's a cultivar of evening primrose, by the way. It's called Tina James Magic Evening Primrose. If you want to delight your friends, especially kids, but actually adults are very kid-like with this, this is a great one to grow where you're going to be hanging out in the evening um, because it will open up before your eyes in a way that looks like you're watching um, time-lapse photography. And so you can have several flowers on a given stem and you'll watch them open up in stages. They kind of just like click open, they pop open, mechanically pop over the course of maybe 15 minutes or something like that. I've watched a group of chefs like just totally odd, like a bunch of them going, oh my God, it's alive. And it's like, well, all plants are alive, but this is animated. You know? <laughs> so the leaves are edible. Um, not that exciting to me. The flowers are edible. What it's really prized for is the root. It's got a, a, a tasty edible root. But also the seeds, the seeds are high in gamma linoleic acid. And that's a source of nutrition that's really good for us. And what my friend Yana does is she collects the seeds and puts them in a coffee grinder and grinds them up and puts them on her morning cereal. They make a lot of seeds. You can get a lot of seeds from an evening primrose. So it's one of those plants that gives on many levels and including like pleasure in the evening for the family. More interesting than the latest sitcom. All right, and then over here, there's a collection. I looked at this and I was like, oh, this is a perfect picture to put in because it shows a whole bunch of things that are edible, some of which are commonly known, like dill, um, but also um, borage. Borage is regularly used in Italy as a, an ingredient added to other greens. They don't tend to cook a lot of bor borage greens together, but they cook a little bit of borage with a lot of different greens. And I'm pretty sure that the FDA says this is carcinogenic, it's closely related to comfrey, which I know they say is carcinogenic. But if you look at other cultures, people have been eating this for hundreds of years and doing quite well, eating it in moderation. But still in moderation, they're getting a diversity of nutrition. And so you're kind of in the same category with Biden's Pelosa. I'm not just saying flat out eat it, but know that there are cultures that do eat it and they eat it in moderation and probably in moderation is quite good for them. Trying to see here now, I think someplace in this picture that I don't have it blown up enough well enough to see here. But I'm pretty sure if you really look closely, you're also going to see some cilantro going to, um, to seed here. Yeah, um, well, I'm not going to worry about it right now. But there's, I think if you look closely, there's cilantro in there too. And then finally, in the background is opium poppy. And we're going to talk about that more later. But of course, the seed is always edible. That's where we get poppy seed from is from the opium poppy, but we'll go into that more later.
but that plant is also an edible. So this is a whole bunch of plants that we plant close together because they flower at different times and they feed the be beneficial insects. And we call that farmscaping. It's actually one word. I think it got separated by our excellent editor, but <laughs> I think it's, we've, we've, decided, we've made the word up, so we get to call it as one word. Um, and we just would, we'll just grow tons of these plants and take them out and scatter them through our garden. But sometimes we'll do in a clump like this too. And that's the case here. Well, there's also, there's a calendula on the left, right behind the dill. And calendula flowers are edible. I'm virtually certain that I checked it out and the leaves are edible too, but you'll want to check that out for sure. But also those flowers are really good for us. They have some ingredient um, that is really good for eyesight, which I don't remember right now, but it's quite good. It's also calendula is used as a false um, saffron. It'll also impart a yellow, nice yellow color. And by the way, it's what some less than scrupulous egg purveyors add to their eggs to give the appearance that their eggs have been, their chickens have been out foraging on lots of greens. Your green, your eggs have deep orange oaks when your chickens have been able to run free and eat lots of weeds and grass. But if you don't do that and you feed them um, calendula flowers, you get the same effect. Though not necessarily the same nutrition. About a 10 minute break? Yes, let's do a 10 minute break. All right, we'll be back. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we're back back at it after the break. And here is a tale, a tale of two, actually three Cleomies. Well, no, not actually. But I was sold, the slide on the right is Brassica abyssinicum, or Ethiopian cabbage, also called African cabbage. Watch out for those common names, right? And so I learned that Cleome is grown and known as African cabbage. That's the slide in the middle, right? Cleome ganandra, I guess. I'm, not, I'm gonna massacre the, the pronunciation of these names. Just please bear with me, but you can read them. And I was just fascinated because Cleome is a lovely flower. It's very common in our gardens and the form that we mostly know it in is Cleome hasselerian, hasselariana. Um, and that's the common spider plant it's also known as. It's, it's a really nice focal point in the garden. It's totally carefree, blooms all summer. A great trap crop for harlequin bugs, by the way. You'll, you'll get more harlequin bugs on that and you'll get them sooner on that than you will on your collards and stuff. And you can simply take a big bushel basket, kind of plastic basket, and fill it with a little bit of soapy water in the bottom and just knock the whole plant a couple times. It can take it, a few, a few petals will fall off, but tons of harlequin bugs will fall into there. You could also spray that with a mixture of um, water and insecticidal soap, slightly stronger than label, um, and you'll just kill all the nymphs on the harlequin bugs. So it's a great way to concentrate the harlequin bugs and control them. But it turns out that um, this one African seed collective, it's a name I'm forgetting of right now. I, ooh, oh, I can't quite remember it, but well, I'll put that in the list. It's a great resource. Um, and I'm forgetting it right now, but they, they actually looked at the historical records and they eat the Cleome hasselerania and it's also listed as an edible, but that's not what was brought probably by the, by the slaves who were brought here against their will. They probably brought the middle one and that's what's grown in Africa. But as you can see, that is clearly a Cleome, whereas the one on the right, which if you go to eBay and try to buy African cabbage, the common name for the two on the right, you'll end up getting this brassica, which is a very interesting green and which is quite hot um, tolerant, heat tolerant, and lovely, and I highly recommend it as a green, but it's not what I wanted to buy because I could see this here. If you look at the habit, it's going to also be ornamental, I assure you. So you can grow it as an ornamental eventually, but you could be eating the greens all the time. Now, if we suddenly ran into a supply chain disruption and you needed to find food, you could just eat the commonly available one on the left as a green, but you could actually set yourself up where you had a more abundant leafy version. You can see there's far more leaves and they're bigger on the middle, the middle variety here, um, growing and still get that flower. So you can let it go to flower most times and be quite lovely, but then you would have the greens too. So that's, that by the way, that and the opium poppy were the two inspirations for this whole um, presentation. I, when I realized they're just things that I never would think of eating that are food. And that's the whole point of this talk. Likewise, crepe myrtle, I'm not sure I'm going to want to eat crepe myrtle, but I can if I need to. At least the berries, and I can use the leaves as a seasoning. All right, and then here's two that basically, I think of them as famine food. Um, they're not my favorites, but it, they're around where I am, they're, they're pretty common. And indeed, farmers really want to keep the wild garlic out of their, um, their dairy cows pastures because they'll affect the flavor of the milk. But I know people that collect and eat these all the time. And I have, you know, collected them and eaten them. And I eat them if I, if I needed nutrition, I would eat the, eat the wild garlic and be happy to have it. And then ground ivy, I've known that was edible forever and I have not eaten it until this year for this talk, I cooked some up. And I know why I'm not eating it. It's just, it's very aromatic. It's got some strong volatile oils and it wasn't my favorite to taste and I wasn't excited about the texture, but there's can be tons of it. And if I need food, boy, I'll be eating it and I won't be complaining. It also, by the way, has medicinal qualities, which I haven't looked up, but I know it's considered a medicinal. And interestingly, it is, according to Stephen Howard Booner, um, one of the main sources of flavoring for the traditional beers before the great first drug war. And if you want to know more about that, read Stephen Howard Booner, basically, 
way back when the priests decided that they didn't want people drinking all these beers that were flavored with things like swamp rosemary, not a plant I know, I wanted, or bog rosemary rather. I'd like to know more about bog rosemary, but I know nothing about it at the moment, except that it was used in place of, or prior to the use of hops, right? Hops was one of many plants that were added to beers to add bitter, to counteract that sweet from the malt, but also to work as a preservative. And ground ivy is another one. And someday, and yarrow is another one. We're going to touch on yarrow later. And so I'm more interested for that use, but it could also be food, and apparently, not that I've looked it up yet, medicine. So that's just the, to touch on the fact that there's foods out there. Another one that's real common here in the mountains that I don't have listed is black willow. Black willow is a common riparian willow um, that's native to Western North Carolina and many other places. It's it's decent for, for kind of coarse bas basketry. It's one of the best for forage for animals, high, higher in protein and more palatable than a lot of the other willows. And its bark is the second highest source of psilocyclic acid, which is the ingredient in aspirin. And wi white willow bark, which is the one that's highest, is a commonly used um, pain reliever, you know, an herbal form of it. Interestingly, that bark in times of famine, the inner bark can be peeled off of the black willow. And what's cool about that is you could cut the black willow to the ground, you're not really hurting it. It'll just shoot up tons more shoots, come back strong, still continue to hold the banks of that stream and be this really wonderful, important riparian plant. But you could actually take that bark, that inner bark off, dry it, grind it, and make a flower which would nourish you. Nobody claims that you'll enjoy eating it, but it would be food you could eat if you needed to, and you wouldn't be particularly damaging the environment. Um, you would just be slowing down the progress of that plant towards a good-sized timber tree, which it's also good for. And important to know about willows, two things I also love about them, is they're one of the less commonly available sources of food for both endo and mycorrhizal mycorrhizae. We're not going to get into that now, but usually plants are either endo or ecto mycorrhizal, and willows are both endo and ecto, which I kind of love. And they also have extra floral nectaries, so they're feeding insects when they're not in flower, but they're in flower very early in the spring or even in the late winter, which is a perfect time for all those insects that are almost out of food to come out on a warm day, get a meal, go back into the cracks and crevices in the rocks, in the bark, make it through the winter and be there as adults for the next, next season. Some insects overwinter as adults and the willows are a great source of that. Okay, and you don't have a picture here, but you can find a picture of black willow pretty readily. All right, and then the larger landscaping plants. A common one, a lovely one, that's really common in front of buildings in Asheville. And when I visited my aunt in Pennsylvania at her nursing home, was in front of her nursing home. It's in front of our local Goodwill. It's all over the place. It's a small, tight little um, landscaping tree is the service berry. There's a lot of different service berries. This particular one, Autumn Brilliance, is all over the place. So you could put a really nice little ornamental tree in your yard, have tons of delicious berries. There's also a, a bush type called Saskatoon. There's a lot of edible service berries, and it's the berries that you would eat from that. And then on the right here, this is a picture of the filbert. I could have, I had pictures of the, of the plants, but for some reason my camera's hiding them from me. Thank you, Google Pictures, for giving me a hard time, but I couldn't really find them. But this was such a lovely picture of the fruit that I just say, yeah, we'll just use this. What I like this about, it's not really commonly used as a landscaping plant, but it'll get to about eight feet tall by three feet wide, and it's a lovely bush with, with, flat, with leaves that turn yellow in the fall. Um, the wood is used for making um, woven fences. It's got loads of uses, and it, if you look at our video with Oscar Brown, it was a major food source in the Middle Ages. And indeed, when they find, you know, people have died and were preserved in bogs, so we get to find like a, a very, very well-preserved, very ancient human. If they, when they investigate the foods in their guts, they invariably find hazelnuts if it's that time of year. They were a staple. They're very nutritious. The oil is excellent quality. And if, you, if we bothered to you know, make it a point to tweak our landscapes a little right now and add some things in, also Kusa dogwood is another great landscaping plant that's got a quite a, quite a nice edible um, fruit. 
we could actually increase the amount of food that's around us while still having our lovely landscapes. So that's something else to consider. We're going to touch on that a little more. That's probably another whole subject and lots of other people have covered the subject of edible landscaping. But I just want to cover a few of the, the ones that are either all around us all the time, like the Coosa dogwood or the service berry, especially the autumn brilliance, and then also ones that could be around us all the time, hazelnuts, you know, which are very abundant and are easy to grow and pretty tolerant of conditions. They could easily work well in your landscape. Nobody would know that you were growing them for food. They would just think you had yourself a nice shrub out there. All right, now we come to a little bit of controversy. These plants are at the moment outlawed, or at least in some states, the one on the right is outlawed. Other states, it's now legal. But opium poppy is illegal everywhere that I know of, by, at least as far as the federal government goes, goes. And yet, it is widely grown all over America. And I'd say a whole lot of people who grow it don't know that they're growing an illegal plant and do not know that that lovely flower in their, in their front yard or their backyard that they got from their grandmother and saved, and it just gives them so much joy and feeds the insects a whole lot, by the way, is actually the opium poppy in illegal. And as far as I can tell, there's no real enforcement of that. If you suddenly started harvesting the opium from it, I'm not going to tell you how, but if you do, it's very obvious that you are, and then I would bet that you would get busted. I'm not encouraging, I'm not even encouraging that you would use this plant for medicine right now. Um, even though, as I will say in the next slide, it has many uses, but it's quite astoundingly a source of food and medicine. And indeed, like with any psychoactive plant, there are traditions of indigenous peoples that have used them for spiritual ritual for centuries. And that case here that I know of is some of the mountain tribes in Southeast Asia use the opium in sacred rituals. So, and once again, Stephen Howard Booner, which by the way, I keep mentioning him, and I want to get, take a moment, a little aside, to honor Stephen and his life. He just passed away early, early in December. And if you haven't checked out his books, um, Sacred and Healing Beers is where I read about the um, drug war, where they actually shut down the use of yarrow and bog rosemary and ground ivy as bittering agents in beers and as preservatives in beers because they not only did that but they tended to cause great elation and libido libido libidinousness <laughs> a desire to be romantic with your with your with with your um uh your partner anyways and so the, the monks weren't very happy about all that jubilation and all that um expression of sexuality and so they encouraged the moving away from um, these other uh, beer additives and two hops which tends to sedate you and so that's the story of the drug where it's fascinating reading i recommend the healing it sacred and healing beers and i recommend everything stephen howard booner has ever written it's he's is a remarkable researcher a remarkable writer and i've never had a book of his that i couldn't pick up open open it up anywhere, start reading, and not want to put it down. But he does cover the fact that with psychoactive plants in indigenous cultures, the way they're used, and because they're part of the spirituality, rarely, if possibly never, are they a source of addiction. It's when we get to more separated from nature um, and more processing of the plants that people start to become addicted to these plants. In the, in the indigenous cultures, they're used possibly, probably even frequently, but they're used in ways that are not leading to addiction and they're not altering people in ways that are taking them away from their, from their, from their world and from connection to the world. Um, that's, the, that's the difference. So it's just something to reflect on. And then here, marijuana, which is the, the climate's changing now. There's a whole lot of states that at least say it can be used for medicine. And a bunch even say, hey, it could be used for recreation. Um, there's a lot of tax revenue to be made from that. So the more they realize that, the more that's probably going to happen. But uh, of course, also, marijuana and its virtually identical twin, but just the, one, the plant that has been selected for fiber rather than for THC, hemp, are sources of medicine. I mean, it's pretty, pretty famous now, the impact of medical marijuana on people with out-of-control seizures. 
it's there's hardly anything that's better for it and there's so many other ways i mean one that i first heard about was for easing nausea for people on chemotherapy many many medical uses um, and there are people that can spend hours telling you about all the ways that marijuana will save the planet i mean and to which i want to say we all we had slavery when marijuana was legal so it's not the it's not the only solution to our problems but it is a plant that is very valuable um, it provides food fiber we're thinking about get we have a, we're going to be getting a license to grow hemp next year and we want to use it for biomass as yet another plant that's very good at smothering out weeds and creating a lot of biomass and then of course people use it for recreation and once again spirituality and most famous of that let's go to the next slide because i'm kind of bleeding into that um the rastafarians um you know are the most famous group that use it for spirituality but it's also used by other groups for spiritual purposes um and what's interesting you know that the bread seed poppy which is an opium poppy and is sold in several catalogs um used for culinary purposes is specifically bred to not shatter if you look at a poppy pod let's go back for a second here nope i went too far um, you can see that it's this round pod and there's not one bent over to show you but on the top there's this series of structures that when they open up and they blow in the wind it just kind of spreads poppy seeds really quite nicely as they blow in the wind it's kind of like a salt shaker for poppy seeds but the op the bread seed poppy has been bred to not open open up so it doesn't shatter and those seeds stay there and they're high they're particularly high quality any opium poppy seed can be used in cul for culinary purposes but the bread seed actually is bigger and more more perfect for culinary purposes and but yet fascinating to me is even before you eat those seeds you can eat the leaves and that actually was this i said the cleome the african cleome known as african cabbage was the one plant that made me think about doing this class or this um, presentation but the other one was watching my friend walk it towards their door as i was leaving and they were getting ready to have lunch and bringing a big handful of opium poppy leaves and i'm like what are you gonna do with those he said, i'm gonna eat them and it's like i was amazed you actually eat opium poppy leaves yes where they're grown is a cash crop and there's a lot of things to say about that but they are grown as a cash crop and we're not going to get into that at all but where they're grown as a cash crop they are regularly eaten as a source of nutrition and the leaves are eaten i don't know that you'd want to eat them by the time they go to seed most plants that we eat for greens aren't very good eating once they go to seed but they are a source of greens for people who are growing them as a cash crop um, and then um, medical uses the opium poppy common drugs that are available you know in the drugstore now opiates are they're used for pain relief you know of course there's been a, a whole lot of pain around some of those in recent years but they are they if we suddenly couldn't get to a to couldn't get anything from a drugstore and somebody was in horrible pain people would probably begin to relearn how to use the opium poppy for relief i am not recommending that you self-medicate with this now in fact i'm recommending you not but you be aware that if the time should come when you don't have other sources you seek out the wisdom of others who may know more and learn how to use this it would be literally a godsend because people in pain need to have that pain relieved and people if you had to let's say fix a broken leg or something being able to you know first give somebody you know enough opium tea or whatever so that they could handle that pain that'll be a godsend and of course also you know diarrhea can kill you cholera is an example of that but opium is used in a in a form that you know has been made by you know drug companies now pharmaceutical companies but we could relearn i'm sure if we needed to it's used to suppress diarrhea and it's also used as a cough suppression suppressant and i'm not at all recommending we use that now but knowing that they're there should we no longer have access to our you know level of civilization we're at now where we can go in and buy medicines these are the raw materials of medicines and they're you know commonly growing in lots of people's flower gardens um marijuana not so much you know at least not in the states where it's illegal anyways uh 
that status is changing rapidly um, and where it is legal, you might start to see it as a, as a landscape plant. If somebody is growing their two plants or whatever they're allowed to grow, they might actually have it mixed in with their landscape. The seeds of the um, marijuana or hemp are highly nutritious. And indeed, I regularly buy um, hemp seeds, organic hemp seeds, and add them to my food because I find that as I get older, I need to supplement my magnesium a little bit or I tend to get um, cramps. And so I don't want to take uh, you know, vitamins and minerals. I don't want to take pills. I want to eat my nutrition. I want to get my, nutri my nutritious nutrient needs through plants. And so I look forward to being able to grow hemp and harvest my own hemp seeds too. Right now I buy them and they're, they're quite delicious. I love them. Uh, it's also, of course, a source of fiber. And that, you know, there's a whole fascinating history about how it was used and encouraged to be grown as hemp during World War II and how the government in the 70s spent millions and millions of dollars trying to eradicate the ditch weed, which was everywhere because so much hemp was grown in the Midwest. And, you know, they didn't succeed, of course, once the weed is out, it's hard to eradicate, but they should have relaxed because you, <laughs> I'm sure it was nothing that anybody wanted to smoke. It was bread for rope and that's what it was good for. You know, um, and I think that's about it on those. I think they're powerful plants and they, what, how legal they are is not germane to this discussion. What's important to know is that they are present in our communities already. And if we suddenly don't have access to drugstores, we will figure out together how to make the medicine we need. And these will be important resources for that. And otherwise, I hope that we learn as a society to support the pe people who have dependence issues and not punish them. And hopefully we can have less of those problems in the future. We have a lot of them now, obviously. All right. And Biden's Pelosa showed up twice. Boy, I like that name, I guess. I lost track of that. I had gotten, I, was, I did this over a fair amount of time and I'd lost track that I'd already put it in. But this is a little more of a close up and a little bit nicer that way. And here it's more talking about its medicinal qualities, and I already did discuss that, so I won't spend more time. But it's also the point that, you know, it will make a nice addition to a landscape. For an informal landscape, a cluster of this will be lovely. You'll have lots of flowers, and you can eat the leaves, probably in moderation, but you can. Um, and if you were hungry, you would eat more of them, you know, and you wouldn't eat them. Hopefully you wouldn't be hungry for a very long time, and you wouldn't have eaten enough if it does cause esophageal cancer, which I don't know that it would be an issue. Um, so they'd be a source of, you know, might, you might put that more towards famine food as far as quantity, though smaller amounts occasionally right now might be perfectly fine. And then on the right, it's kind of a misleading picture because you might think that the leaves for this lovely flower, which is the red spider lily, um, Coralus radiata is the Latin name for this, are the leaves that you're seeing, but no, it is actually shooting up through a whole lot of dock. And doc was one that I hadn't thought to put in there, but it actually can be eaten. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that later. It's related to the sheep sorrow and the rhubarb. And it goes deep and makes a lot of, um, I mean, it, it does a lot of dynamic accumulating. It pulls up a lot of minerals and stuff. So the food would be very good for you. You'd have to cook that size leaf a long time, but I'll, I'll get to that actually. Turns out there's some people that consider doing that. I haven't. But the red spider lily is the most potent suppressor of coronaviruses that we know among herbs. I'm not recommending using it because frankly, I don't know how to use it. We grow it when we learn that and we look forward to learning that and helping to develop it as a antiviral specific to coronaviruses. But it also quite fascinatingly is used, the product, a, a, a compound that comes from it is used also to alleviate the, uh, the not to cure, but alleviate some of the um, impacts of Alzheimer's disease. It's, you know, much, there's much more science to that than I understand, but quite interestingly, it, and it turns out, I think the root of, of stinging nettle and um, another saxifrage related to the um, branch lettuce I was talking about, salad burnet are all plants that are high in certain properties that are used to relieve some of the impacts of Alzheimer's. They don't cure it, but they can make it so that you are less out of it, I'm guessing, you know. But this one here is known as a naked lady. You don't see any leaves because when it's flowering, the leaves aren't present. 
they come after it flowers in the late summer and then the leaves come up in the fall and grow until hard frost and indeed i'm thinking i could probably put row cover over those leaves and extend how long the leaves grow and get more and more of the um, spider lily for medicinal purposes it's both the root apparently and the flower stem are used for medicinal purposes and i don't know how but it's so powerful that we figured we'd grow it now and see if we can figure out how to use it later and it is very pretty by the way too and you'll if you are out roaming around in the appalachians it is a common you know, feral uh, feral um, you know escape from captivity um, weed on old homesteads you know and you'll only notice it probably when it's in bloom but then you'll be impressed where we planted it at our north farm we have i think about 80 or 100 that survived out of about 180 that we put in and that's exciting that we've got those but we always had one right next to the road where i wouldn't use it for medicine as we turn in and it was there when we bought the property and that's an example of the fact that it's around so you can bump into it okay and then here are two of the the strongest um, herbs that anybody can either forage on the probably either one can be foraged if you know them um, the one on the left is elder elderberry elder flower um, and it turns out according to stephen harrod booner the elder leaf and the elder bark are highly medicinal much stronger than the berry or the flower um, reputed to be toxic as far as western medicine is concerned because if you are sensitive to it which a lot of people are consuming the bark and the stems or the leaves will give you nausea and cause you to throw up that's all it will do though and Stephen has and we put it in our resource page a recipe for decocting it whereby you put it in the right amount of water with the right amount of leaf either dry or fresh and you make sure you're turning the water the heat on when when it's in the water so everything that you're decocting has to heat up with the water and you basically simmer that until you've reduced the volume of the water by half and you've now decocted it and that aspect that causes nausea nausea has been denatured and i can testify i've made a lot of that over the last two years i've shared it with a lot of people nobody's gotten nauseous but everybody that's taken it has experienced a diminution of their symptoms if they had symptoms or no onset of symptoms if they discovered they had it but the symptoms had, come, had not happened yet i haven't done replicated trials i can't prove that um that's you know that's how it works and indeed i'm going to take a moment to speak to how we prove that stuff and why some of these plants are demonized by the fda and why they say oh we can't prove that we've never proved it and stuff i'm going to speak to that in a moment but first i want to speak about the plant on the right i was fascinated to learn about this i thought it was going to be another source of summer greens i say it's a source of summer flavoring i think it's way too strong to eat a lot of it um but it's a common food throughout Southeast Asia. And indeed, this is, one of its names is fish mint. It's also Latin name is Hoytonia cordata. And there's actually a cultivar known as chameleon that's variegated. And there's a reason why you might wanna grow that though it's probably not as medicinal. And that reason is that this plant is one of the most invasive plants I know. Joe Hollis, who you may have heard referred to here on Living Web several times, uh, is a, one of our mountain treasures. He's had a, the largest collection of Ch Chinese medicinal plants and perennial vegetables on the East Coast in his amazing gardens at up in Silo, North Carolina. He's a neighbor of mine at my homestead in Silo. Um, and he describes this plant as ineradicable. If you get it, you won't be able to get rid of it. So you see it's growing in a container here. And I found a strategic place on the, ho the house that I live in here in Mills River when I'm working where I can grow it in the ground, but it can't go anywhere. And you must do that. And indeed, if I leave this property, which I eventually will most certainly do, if I'm getting close to doing that, I will cover the, that patch of Hoytonia cordata with black plastic or cardboard and leaves and totally kill it before I leave so that somebody else doesn't come and move it around and spread it because it is way too invasive. But because of that, it could well be growing in your neighborhood. And this plant in Laos, the same folks that came through that I talked about early, earlier, um, this Laotian ag professor said when he looked at this plant, it is used as an anti-COVID 
uh, medicine in, in Laos. They make a pill out of it and give it to people for COVID. And it is, there are plenty of papers showing that it suppresses the replication of, of the uh, coronaviruses. And I've used it that way to great effect. And the great thing about this is both of these, the elder is readily found in the mountains of North Carolina growing wild. You can collect the leaves all summer long and you're not gonna hurt the plant as long as you don't take too much from one plant. And the Hoytania can produce, a I couldn't possibly make medicine out of as much as I grow, nor could I sell it to the few people I've taught how to eat it. It's interesting that it's eaten different ways in Southeast Asia, in Laos, they eat it as a um, condiment after taking a bite of, um, of Laotian barbecue. They'll then grab the tender tips of the hoitania and eat that as a follow-up um, to, the, to the barbecue. So they eat it in tandem with the barbecue. And then the other, some of the other folks that were visiting us here from Southeast Asia from Burma, and they said they, they cook it in their curries. And I've read that there's various other ways that it use, it's used in Vietnam. If you look, by the way, at their incidences of COVID, both outcomes and infections, they seem to not be doing as poorly as we are. I'm not gonna say that this is why, but it might be why, because it is a commonly used food. It's a fascinating flavor that a lot of, a lot of American or Western palates are gonna have to get used to. And what I'd say to that is the best way to get used to it is to have it with spicy food. It really is meant to be eaten with spicy food. It, it's way too strong for a, a less spicy um, palate. Okay. All right, so here we have um, some other natives. And I was always fascinated, not natives, ornamentals rather. I was always fascinated by Mahonia when I lived on, out in the Berkeley area. I remember my wife who was a, a, was a landscaper for, uh, a landscape gardener for her living, knew all these plants and she put them out there and I'd say, what's that one again? I was always taken by how dramatic it looked. And I loved it as an ornamental. It's a not really nice ornamental. It's, a, it's a, a good center plant. It could also be a, something that works well in the background, but it could be a, a focal point also. Um, and then I would be reading about various herbal cures for things and they'd say, Oregon grape. And I was like, well, what's Oregon grape? Is, where do you get this grape, right? Well, it's not a grape at all. So much for common names. It's got berries that are very abundant and blue. And so it got named Oregon grape. What it, this is used for is what's in the root. And the root is, has berberin, just like golden seal, our yellow root. And that is a, a particularly valuable herbal medicine, particularly for treating um, any um, of our mucous membrane infections, like for a sinus infection or something like that, I would use golden seal. You don't want to overdo these, er these herbs, they're, they're quite strong, but if you're sick, an episodic use with guidance from an herbalist or you know, a doctor who's really enlightened and willing to use plants also, highly effective. Once again, medicine that would be in any number of yards. And so drug stores are closed and we need medicine. This is, I mean, golden seal is a noted notedly powerful antibacterial, um, you know, useful for all kinds of things, particularly, like I say, for infections of the mucous membranes. And then ginkgo, an incredibly gorgeous tree, kind of infamous if you've got both sexes growing for the odor, which is not appealing to a lot of people in the spring. I've never been bothered by it that much, but it's, it is used for its leaves. They're harvested at a specific time. You'd wanna learn when to harvest them, I think we're kind of in between the two times here where we'd want to harvest them. They're not harvested when they're green, they're harvested maybe right before they start turning green, um, before they start to lose their green in the fall. Though I've also seen them harvested at the right time in the spring. Um, and they're harvested for their medicinal qualities and what they're really great for is helping, helping with, with memory issues and with nervous, nervous kind of issues with the nervous, nervous system. And so it's, it's a lovely shade tree. It's a huge landscape tree, right? Um, you can find them all. I have a great big one in my yard that I keep meaning to find the right time to harvest a bunch of leaves that can make so much tincture. Um, but I haven't done it yet, but it's out there and it's medicine that people could have around. And if you look it up, there's lots of ways that it's used medicinally. And it's a common, common tree in, in cityscapes. It's one of the oldest trees 
that we know, by the way. It's a very ancient tree. All right, and then here's two that are everywhere. There's three pictures, but it's two versions of the plantain. In the summertime, it's, these are incredibly common weeds, and they're so useful. Um, both of them, by the way, I also mentioned earlier on, are foods. The young leaves of these work great in salads or can be cooked. Once again, a lot of these foods that if you need to eat them young and stuff, the idea would be to make it like a game or a way that you reward your children and get them to harvest that. That's the way indigenous, you know, nobody is not part of how indigenous tribes all over the world make it. Even the kids do what they can, and it's important to them. They're a part of, you know, of maintaining their community. That's not like, you know, they don't get pleasure from it too, and you could probably get it that you could, you know, maybe with a little bribe or start out with them and then ask them if they'll do it and stuff. Do the busy work of collecting lots of tiny leaves, because these are going to be good food that's not famine food, that we really enjoy eating only at their youngest leaves. But that's a great thing for kids to do. And so many of those weeds I was showing you that, you know, we normally would cook, like the uh, upland cress, also known as creasy greens, you'd want to cook that if it was bigger, but the youngest leaves are going to be quite nice. And they, they, enough of these young leaves from these kinds of weeds that are medicinal or that we've already talked about, add it to a salad that you had maybe just a little bit of lettuce or something, um, could become a really nice salad and quite, quite a bit better for you than the average salad that we have now. What I love about both these plants is their ready availability for when I either am unlucky or I mess up, okay? So we've already spoken of the fact that these are food, and this was taken in the wild, but it's a little pinkish. The white one is more commonly thought as the most medicinal. It's the way they usually manifest when, they're, when they haven't been bred for colors. Um, I got a lesson in genetics from my good friend Jackie Greenfield one time when I was growing the cultivars of status, which is a dried flower. And I kept selecting all of the strongest ones first to pot up. And Jackie said, Pat, if you do that, they're all going to be blue. Because that's the color that status is normally. And when they breed it, they're giving up some of the vigor in order to get those other colors. And likewise with yarrow, you can get wonderful, wonderful collections of pastel, different colored yarrows. I love them. They make me happy. The insects like them a lot. Maybe not quite as much as the white ones, but they're not necessarily quite as medicinal. If you can't find anything else, use them. They're going to do you some, some good, indeed a lot of good. But if you really want the most medicinal, you want the white one, or in this case, one that's got a little pink, but it still is the wild one. And how this is used, yarrow was called spear heel, heel in, in Old English. That's what yarrow means, rather. Yarrow in Old English means spear heel. And it was used for healing really serious wounds. And I could testify that I've been stupid at times and given myself some pretty serious cuts. And at times when I had no time to actually probably go to the hospital and get stitches, they were that bad. But I couldn't even stop long enough to go to the house and get a Band-Aid because I needed to get my work done and be somewhere. And what I learned I could do is chew up the yarrow because that's my mouth is a mortar and pestle, right? And this is an edible green, so it's fine to chew it up. Chew it up, find a big fat blade of grass, tie it onto my wound with a blade of grass. And the minute I tie it on, that throbbing you get from a bad cut as the blood is pulsing out of you stops and the bleeding stops. And lo and behold, not only does it stop the blood flow, but it is an anti-bacterial. Um, it's, it stops infection. And indeed, I've had a, a wound like that that by the next day it was already starting to heal, except for the minor fact that there was still some black color in there from that chewed up yarrow. So it looked pretty ugly, but it didn't hurt at all. You know, I, have a, I think I have a picture somewhere of a nail cut halfway through. That's how deep the cut was, right, from the side. And I stopped the bleeding and the pain and was healing within a day simply using yarrow, whereas what we normally would do for those kind of cuts is go get a couple stitches. All right, and then in the center we have lance leaf plantain. Both the plantains, the broad leaf, which is on the right, and the lance leaf, 
are great for stings and bites. Any sting and bite. Once again, you're out in the world, you don't have a mortar and pestle, you use your mouth, they're edible anyways. You chew them up really well, put them on. I like to chew up and add new pieces because it keeps me distracted from my pain and I'm sure I've got the strongest pulling powder. But I first learned about this and its effectiveness from a friend who got told by a mountain neighbor who had been here for generations and had a lot of herbal folklore. She said, what can I use to get glass out of my daughter's foot? And they said, plantain. So it draws that strongly. It just will draw anything out. If I get bit by a poisonous snake, I'm going to the hospital. But on my way, if I can grab some plantain and chew it up, I'm going to be putting on there and trying to draw out any poison that I can. I'm not saying don't go to the hospital, but if meanwhile you could be drawing out some poison, it's a good thing. So these are both food and medicine, and they're usually all around us here in the mountains of, and a lot of eastern, eastern USA. Um, okay, and then ones that really work well, would work well in the landscape. Ginger isn't commonly grown, and I waited too long to take the pictures, so I don't have a picture of the foliage, but it's a very pretty foliage. It's just these branches of opposite leaves growing out. Um, and it could be, you know, it's kind of feathery looking. It could be a nice background foliage. Its flower is lovely and you very likely will get it to flower if you get it in early enough and it's doing well. It's not quite as hardy as the turmeric, which it's related to. So I haven't had as much success getting it to overwinter, but you can start it early. You can start it by just buying ginger at the store. I mean, this is, I know there are many people saying, no, you can't do that. You're gonna get diseases. Ironically, I took a lecture on growing ginger where they said you must buy seed stock that's disease free. I could never buy it, they were always sold out. So I instead bought it from my local co-op and grew it in a pot because it's about soil diseases. Made sure it didn't have diseases, propagated it, and then could plant it out in the ground and wasn't worried about disease. Ironically, years later, a friend gave me some of the stuff that was from the seed stock that wasn't supposed to have disease, that it was seed quality ginger. That's the only plant I ever had that got a disease. It wasn't a terrible disease, but it was sick. None of the other ones were sick. So it's not necessarily considered best practice, but I've done it. I simply buy um, organic gin ginger, grow it for a year or two in a pot to be sure that it doesn't have disease and then use that. Basically, you take your ginger and let it sprout. And once it's sprouted, you plant it. If you want to speed up the sprouting, you put it in a pot in a warm place. Joe Hollis actually once it's in the ground, so there's soil covering, it boils boiling water on top of it and speeds up. You know, by the time it goes through the soil, it's not going to be boiling, of course. But ginger is amazing medicine. It's also a great one to use for COVID. You just take lots and lots of ginger and make strong tea and drink it all the time. It suppresses all the viruses. It's really powerful medicine. And then echinacea is pretty famous. I don't know that I have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's lovely. I really reflected recently on the fact that um, my neighbor and friend Greta Dietrich has talked to me about, oh, we don't want to harvest all those seeds. We need to leave them for the birds too. And I realized that birds are really prone to viruses. And I'm sure that in nature, both the um, green coneflower are so chan that we talked about earlier and the echinacea are very antiviral too. And the birds are probably getting some of their medicine as they eat those seeds, because they love to eat the seeds. For coronavirus, you want to make, you want to get a tincture or make a tincture of the three-year-old Augustifolia, Echinacea Augustifolia root. That's the one that is most effective for coronavirus or COVID. But for Echinacea purpurea, for years, by following um, Stephen Booner's direction, I have used the echinacea tincture and the um, elderberry tincture at that point, I didn't know about elder leaf tincture. And I took a dropper full, the small two ounce bottle, not the four ounce bottle dropper that is commonly available for tinctures, one dropper full under my tongue or sublingual every hour. And I would knock out, if I was starting to feel a flu coming on and I did that religiously, it would stop it in its tracks. If I didn't, Dose, I could get a wicked flu and be really the two sickest time, like, the two sickest episodes I've had in the last 15 years were the flu. And both times I neglected the symptoms and didn't dose until too late. And then boom, I got quite sick. So I highly recommend echinacea. It of course is lovely. The um, Augustifolia needs drier conditions. So you want to put it someplace that's drier 
or it won't do as well, but I've got it growing quite successfully on our berms out at the Grandview Farm. And you want to leave it in for three years or so. The flowers are also medicinal, but not as medicinal. Um, but you could pick the flowers and use them for medicine. Of course, they're feeding the beneficials. They're lovely. And as Greta pointed out to me, the birds are eating the seeds. So these are two that can easily be part of our landscape. The ginger isn't yet, but should be. The echinacea isn't a lot. Of, but once again, remember, the cultivars are not going to be nearly as medicinal. You want the purpurea and the augustifolia in their original forms for the highest medicinal value. All right, and here's two that could be um, food um, readily. And actually, interestingly, the Okinawa spinach, the one on the right, if you look it up, it's off the charts as far as how good it is for you and good for so many things that humans in, in modern society now have to deal with, like blood sugar issues and blood pressure issues and all those kinds of things. The Okinawa spinach is an incredible perennial, probably in its own climate, you know, where it doesn't freeze, but here it'll freeze back. If you mulch it really well, there's a chance it'll come back. It's about 1 16th hardy. You can keep it going up until Thanksgiving, probably most years in our zones, which is probably six or something, by putting row cover over because it won't freeze with the first frost. But once you get this going, it's a very lovely plant. I think only in the lower, lower right, lower left, rather, right there, you can see that the back side of the leaf is purple. There's a lot more usually when it's growing if you're seeing the back lives too, side too. It's a deep purple, very lovely, deep green, incredibly abundant green that you can cook all summer. He, it, just, it's, it doesn't get bothered by the heat at all. Nothing I've seen bothers it much, but it's quite good eating. Um, once again, it lends itself to Asian cuisine. It's got a little bit of a resinous aftertaste and slightly slimy, not nearly as slimy as okra, or by its neighbor in this slide, Malabar spinach, which I'll talk about in a minute. But enough so that it works really well in those um, stir fries, where you're then adding something like um, kudzu, our, our, our root, to make a fine glazed starch, kind of glazed, starch-based glaze for everything. You don't really notice the sliminess at all. Like I say, it's pretty minor. Um, and the resinous is actually becomes part of the complex flavor that's in the curries that lend themselves to Thai cooking. Okay, and then on the left, there's Malabar spinach. A lovely one, one that I've always thought would be perfect for if you had like a window that gets much too much sun in the summertime, you could get this going and pretty quickly if you started it in a big pot ahead of time, probably make a trellis that shaded you on the west side, let's say, in the summer, um, and also get to eat it all the time. It's a little slimier than the Okinawa spinach, still not nearly as slimy as okra, but all of that, by the way, is very good for our intestines. It's, it really helps them. And indeed, Joe Hollis mentioned to me once that prior to the um, humans developing the ability to, to press oil, slimy plants were far more prized because they helped to have those coarse grains that were often poorly ground, be a little bit more palatable. That sliminess worked like oil to make it more um, palatable to eat those coarse grains. This is a lovely plant. This is the red stem version. And it'll just grow like crazy in the heat and produce tons of leaves. They're mild tasting and lend themselves to being added to other greens. I'm not a big fan of this straight up, but about 10 to 15% Malabar spinach leaves added to other cooking greens just makes those greens want to melt in your mouth. It just adds this really delectable tenderness to it. And by the way, the berries can be used like okra to thicken soups. So it's, I don't know that it's got medicinal qualities, but both of these aren't in American landscapes yet, but could be. And if we took to doing that, and then all of a sudden we couldn't get to the grocery store, we might hit these a lot harder than we do usually. And they'd be giving us good nutrition. Okay, and then deep nutrition and um, also some medicine. So on the left here, we have the, the, the sun, the sun loving stinging nettle, not the woodland nettle, but the stinging nettle. Um, and it's, it's all over the place. It's escaped. If you bump into it, you know it for sure. As I was saying, there's some powerful medicinal qualities to the roots. This is wonderful eating in the springtime. A lot of people say you don't want to eat it before it goes to flower. Doug Elliott disputes that. I don't really have a 
opinion in it. I find it easy enough to cut it back and not have it go to flour, but I doubt that it's very toxic. Um, Doug says he's eaten it a lot, uh, even when it's not when it's in flour. But this is one of my favorite greens, but I have to cook it enough. Otherwise, it doesn't really have that calcium silica thing that's going to be poisonous to you, but it just it's got this gritty, nasty texture if I don't cook it enough. So I like to make soups with it more than anything. It's the deepest green you'd ever see. If you cook this, the water is just amazing. It is such a deep green and it's loaded with nutrition. And by the way, high in protein also. So it's a great plant to have around for many purposes. And one other purpose, there's this thing called, um, what's, and I forget the exact way to say it, but anyways, it's me medicine using the stings of bees. And I actually, have a friend in Florida that I'll go to, every time I'm down there, I'll have them sting my knees because otherwise my knees bother me. And when you get stung by a bee, there's a natural release of cortisones. And I'm not ever going to take the pharmaceutical cortisones. The side effects are, there's a lot of them. I don't need them. I just get stung once in a while and that solves my problem. A lot of people, for one thing, may have a really severe reaction to that. So you want to make sure that it's okay for you to be stung, you know, and be real careful about that. But also, a lot of people just don't want to get stung. <laughs> it's not a lot of fun. You can actually take the same active ingredient, ingredient, right? Formic acid is in the stinging nettle and causes the sting in that, as is in what's causing the pain in a bee sting. So you can literally take the stinging nettle and brush those inflamed areas that are bothered and get relief that's similar, though not as strong, from stinging nettle. And then dandelion is medicinal and basically, and it's just deep, you know, deep, deep nutrition, which is really good for lots of, you know, if you're having, if, you, if you've if you been sick and stuff, the dandelion is really going to help to restore you that way. There, may, there probably are other uses too, but the greens are edible. And by the way, my wife and I have learned, as it's commonly said that you just want to pick those greens early in the spring or they'll be too bitter. But we've learned that we can pick them if they're, if they're not in flower, but lush and green, we'll pick them, eat them, eat them any time of year and just use that acid trick, just season them a little bit with lemon juice or with um, vinegar or something, and then they're perfect. Yeah, so really great, and that flowers are also edible, also famous for making wine, which my wife made one time. I was impressed by her incredible in industry to pick that many flowers, but it was a very interesting wine. And actually we could, you know, we could, she made it so it wasn't too sweet too. It was really quite complex and interesting. So two plants that are all over the place and can nourish us and provide us with medicine readily. All right, and then resources. Um, herbal antivirals, I can't recommend it enough. Also, I didn't have it in here, I guess that was a mistake. Um, herbal antibiotics, and they're, they're just an amazing pieces. I recommend you buy both of them, and they be go-to resources for you when you're sick. And indeed, Bunarasso will just fascinate you when he talks about how um, antibiotic resistance gets spread in the herbal antibiotics and stuff. The science in there, he goes into it in detail. It is fascinating. I highly recommend those books. Like I said, I can open up either of those books anywhere in the book and I won't stop reading for an hour or two. I just, I'll be fascinated. Even I meant to go, get, I'll probably remain sick because I'm too busy reading. Um, and then Nature's Garden, um, Guide to Identifying and Harvesting and Preparing Edible Wild Plants. That's the one I picked out. There's four of them by Samuel Thayer, and he's just, he's just over the top about it all. Um, my same friend who I referred to a few times, who um, inadvertently gave painless blisters to her friend when she fed her um, Tagades Minuta, has described being in communication with Samuel Thayer and letting him know that some plant thing was happening that doesn't happen all the time, and he literally did an all-night drive from Michigan to come experience that plant thing and then drove back in the same time frame. I mean, the guy's over the top. You know? <laughs> so you're going to definitely get tons of information from any book by Samuel Thayer. Um, and yeah, I do say those are just those are the ones I picked, but I recommend all of their books. Any of the stuff they talk. And then Around the World in 80 Plants is a wonderful examination of unusual plants that are food all over the world. And I have to constantly regret that I'm not in touch with, with Joe Hollis more because Stephen Barstow actually had heard of Joe Hollis's crop, um, garden in Celo, North Carolina, and made it a point to stop and visit him 
only two years ago. I found about, out about it after the fact. Boy, that's, that was a big mistake. I hate that I missed that. Okay, and then Stephen Harrod Booner uh, on treating coronavirus. He's got several protocols that he did. He did several versions of it. Some people who have taken his protocols and made medicine did get letters from the FDA saying you can't do that, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about it. We're not selling anything and you can make your own decision, read what he says and decide if you wanna make stuff and use it for yourself. And indeed, why I wanted to be sure that was there because he does have the recipe in that for how to, how to properly treat the elder leaf so that it won't make you nauseous if you are sensitive and still have all of the powerful um, medicine that comes with it. And then more Stephen Harrod Booner. And then um, this was one that I really used a lot and I failed to make it an active link, but you can't you get, well, maybe you could if it's on your, I don't know if you could actually get an active link off of YouTube. But anyway, I wish I'd gotten it to be an active link. Doesn't matter though. You can add it in the description. Yeah, okay, yeah. Anyway, what's great about this is I just wanted, I was trying to figure out, is this, ed I'm, I'm wondering if that's edible. Example, right? California poppies are edible. Now, read carefully, you know, hear about it and do your research because you want to be very careful in how you cook them and you probably would be famine food. I wouldn't recommend that you just go eating a lot of California poppies all the time. They're medicinal, by the way. Um, you know, they're, they're an excellent tincture for, you know, if you have trouble getting to sleep at night stuff, they're used that way. So that's another medicine that is in lots of gardens. But as far as eating it, I would be, you know, very careful about what I read about it. But, but I was able to confirm that it, that it was edible by going to this page. And it's just a great page for all these plants, so many more than I've talked about tonight, that are food. And indeed, they're talking about them as raw food. A lot of them, I think, oh, I'd rather cook that. But they are, you know, it's a great, the index on that page is wonderful. I recommend their information. I vetted it other places. They don't seem to be saying anything dangerous. And it's pretty comprehensive and pretty darn great. And then one that I just remembered right now while we're talking about it that isn't here, but if you look up ECHO, ECHO is a nonprofit that, that makes it a point to propagate and make available to people um, in the Southern hemispheres in particular, plants that will increase their access to nutrition. They're a great nonprofit to support. And depending on how you qualify, like I qualify as a community activist, I can get seeds and stuff from them if I request them, but you can also possibly get seeds and plants from them. All right, well, I think that covers it. I think you know now that simply paying attention and maybe diving in a little bit here and there, I have only scratched the surface. There are so many plants out there that can nourish us and help us to heal if all of a sudden, for some reason, we don't have access to our normal sources of food and medicine. Thank you, and we'll catch you next time. Let me check the questions. Yep, let's answer some questions. I'll just check and see if there is any. Give a quick five minute intermission.
Okay, so we took a moment to see if there are any questions. It doesn't look like there's any questions. We can wait another few moments if anybody's got a question. You could just type in yes and then take a moment to write your question out if you've got it. But if not, then we're going to sign off for tonight. And I do want to say, let me know if you've tried some of these foods. Let me know if you think that they're fine food, fair food, or famine food. But if you're, if you're going to get adventurous, be in touch, pat at livingwebfarms.org. Let me know what out there was a delight to discover and what out there you wished you never tasted. <laughs> Actually, I don't think anything I've talked about is that is going to go and be in that category. Um, though I have ever offered various things like, for instance, if you get the wrong person and you give them a taste of anise hyssop, you might ruin their day. Or lovage is an herb, a celery perennial herb type plant that I once gave somebody a taste of and it ruined their day. But most of these things are not quite that strong. All right, well. That's it. Okay, no questions. Thank you. Good night. Have a joyous solstice season.